Thanks, thanks to everyone for coming. Buenas tardes. Uh, I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm the Director for Global Health Policy here at the Center for Global Development. And we're really pleased to welcome you to today's conversation that is co-hosted with the Inter-American Development Bank on how health benefits plans are working to move Latin American countries in the direction of universal health coverage. So there's no single path to universal health coverage known here in Washington as UHC after a United Nations resolution that was passed in 2012. But at the same time, countries are expected to advance on three dimensions. First, they have to define and expand priority services. Second, they have to include more people. And third, they have to reduce out-of-pocket spending on health. So defining these priority services, and for whom, and by extension, to what extent there will be financial protection, that can be done in many ways. Health benefits plans are not the only way to accomplish this, but it is one very good way, and it is the subject of our conversation today. These plans have been recommended to and implemented in at least 60 low- and middle-income countries since the 1993 World Development Report was published. And today we're going to hear an overview of some very important work that has been undertaken by the IDB to systematize and learn from the Latin American experience. And we'll also hear from two government officials from Mexico and Chile who have advanced rapidly in this area. We at CGD have also done a lot of work on priority setting for health in collaboration with many of you sitting here today. And so we hope that you'll take some of our materials as you go out. And we'll also let you know that the book will be available also on your way out, but not before you get to hear about the report today. The way we'll organize our session, first we'll welcome Ferdinando Regalia, who's the Division Chief of the Social Protection and Health Division at the Inter-American Development Bank, to introduce the issue, and he'll in turn introduce Ursula Gideon, who's one of the authors of the book. After that, Ursula will sit down and we'll have Eduardo Gonzalez Pierre and Sebastián Pavlovich, and I'll introduce them as they come up. Um, and they will give two keynote speeches. And then we'll have a, a panel where I will ask questions, unless you have very good questions and you speak out as well. So with that, thank you very much. Ferdinand. Thank you very much. Good uh, afternoon to everyone. Buenas tardes a todos. And uh, I want to thank CGD for the hospitality of this joint event. Uh, in the last two decades in Latin America and the Caribbean, the growth of public health expenditure has been uh, relatively subdued or moderate. I mean, in the last 15 years, on average, the increase in public health expenditure has been about 0.7% of GDP. That growth in industrialized countries has been much uh, quicker, about three times as fast. So as a result, in purchasing power uh, parity terms, the amount of uh, resources, public resources, are uh, going to the sector in industrialized countries about eight times what we have in the, in the region. And now looking forward to the next decade, with economic growth perspective that are not as positive as the one we had in the last decade, um, probably the uh, estimates of increase in public health expenditure as a share of GDP will be between an increase of between 1 and 1.5% at best in the next two decades. So this is a, a perspective uh, of, the, of the region. On the other end, at the same time, there are enormous pressure on those expenditure coming from both supply side factor and demand factors. Supply side factor is innovation in, uh, in new medical technology, exploration of new markets by a producer, and demand factor, the one you know uh, very well, uh, the demographic and epidemiological transition, uh, the fact that Latin America has become richer and they consume more health. And also, uh, there is, uh, thanks to Twitter, CNN, and uh, social media, much more knowledge of uh, uh, what these medical technologies can do. So in this context, there is a growing gap between what is medically uh, possible and what is financially uh, feasible. So the question is not so much anymore whether governments need to prioritize, but it is how to do it. And it is the how part of the question of this book that we launched today wants to uh, answer. 
certainly I wouldn't want to be in the uh, in the in place of a, a government official in a top government official in Ministry of Wealth in Latin America where they have to decide whether to close the equity gaps and now there will be a lot of pressure post MDG 2015 with the universal health coverage debate or providing cutting edge technology to certain segments of the population. Many countries still use uh, implicit uh, rationing. Uh, others use negative list. Others use a combination of the two. And then they are the only adopters of the uh, uh, number of countries that are adopting now explicit health benefit plans. And some of these early adopters are discussed in this book. Despite the rich experience that we find in the region and uh, beyond the region, there is very little systematization about how to make the uh, process of prioritization. And this is what this book tries to fill in terms of uh, uh, knowledge gap. I want to conclude, uh, first of all, thanking the three editors of this publication, uh, uh, Ursula, uh, Dr. Gideon, <laughs> Uh, Dr. Ricardo Bitran and uh, Ines Tristau, who is a specialist at ADB. I also want to thank the outstanding list of almost 20 co-authors uh, of different chapters, which are, uh, who are very well represented today by Dr. Eduard, Eduardo Gonzalez-Pierre, Deputy Minister of Health in Mexico. I would also like to thank our second keynote speaker of today, Dr. Sebastian Pavlovich, Superintendent of Health in Chile. And finally, I want to thank Samanda, who uh, in her previous life at ADB planted a big seed for this work, which is now coming to fruition, and uh, uh, I hope you will all enjoy. And without further ado, I want to then pass the floor to uh, Dr. Gideon. Uh, she's a health senior economist. She's also the director of the Health Benefit Plans uh, Network for the IDB, and one of the three editors of the book. How do I move the slides? Is there anyone who could tell me how to move the slides here? Oh, this one? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really exciting to be here and finally, after I think almost two years, present our work on benefits package design adjustment in implementation in, in Latin America. Um, I also like to thank uh, CGD for accepting to co-host this event. I think that uh, both entities are very much committed to understand these whole processes of benefits packages much better. Um, I think we all have come to believe that explicit health benefits package are a key element of uh, countries moving towards universal health coverage. So um, Ferdinando has very well summarized why we wanted to carry out this study and why benefits packages matter. So I will jump right into what we consider to be the five key lessons emerging from our analysis. So uh, what we have here are the countries that we have been studying. Um, we studied CAUSES and the Fondo de Protección Contra Gastos Catastroficos that work in the context of the Mexican Seguro Popular. We studied um, a basic benefits package in Honduras, which targets the vulnerable poor in rural areas and basically focuses on maternal health services. We studied the POS, which is the compulsory plan in Colombia. They have now one unique plan for everyone. Uh, we studied the PAS, which is a much more recent experience covering basically those not affiliated um, to, to the formal social security system. We studied AOG, I think that's the most known benefits package in the reason, I guess there have been many presentations about it, and, but there is still a lot to learn from them. We included Plan Nasser, very famous Plan Nasser, but at, at the core of the Plan Nasser actually 
you have the benefits package and it works as kind of um, uh, an organizer of the whole whole plan, plan Nacer project. Then we have a very wide comprehensive benefits package in Uruguay, which is also universal. Everybody accesses uh, these PIAs. And last but not least, um, even though not included in the book, we are now finalizing uh, an analysis of the design and adjustment of benefits packages in the context of the Dominican um, health system. So let's get to the five lessons. First, benefits packages are increasingly important in Latin America. And it's kind of funny that they have had, they were so fashionable at the beginning of the 90s with the World Development Report, and yet there is little evidence, little analysis of these benefits packages. And in Latin America, there are lots of them. And actually, um, according to a study carried out by Amanda, Calypso, and I partici participated myself. Actually, in, in the developing world, uh, Latin America is the most densely populated region in terms of benefits packages. So let's look at, at Latin America. Um, on the left-hand side, you have the countries with some sort of explicit benefits packages. And on the right-hand side, you have countries without explicit benefits packages, so it's about 50-50, I'd say. And um, when you go through the list on the right-hand side, you will find lot of, uh, lots of ex-English colonies, which have basically followed the NHS type system, who, as you know, don't used to have explicit benefits packages. So that was the first message. Second message. Um, sometimes when we hear about benefits packages, we first think of benefits packages as a means to increase efficiency by selecting the most cost-effective health services. That was the way they were promoted um, during the last two decades anyway. But when you look at the experiences in Latin America, actually that's not the only, and it's also not the most important reason. I won't even go into the efficiency um, reason. Uh, every benefits package in the region, region states that it, li it would like to adopt it for efficiency reasons. Um, there are some countries, especially when you have a separation of the payer and um, purchaser function, and you involve the private sector where you necessarily have to specify what services have to be provided in exchange for, for the payment of a premium. But I'd, I'd rather stress the other three reasons that emerge as key reasons um, for adopting benefits packages in the region, at least um, analyzing the three country, the three, the seven country case studies that are in the book. Equity, this wish to guarantee a minimum for all, very much in the line of universal health coverage. A second reason, mobilize resources for and um, planning health resources. And the last one, accountability and answer to an unfulfilled promise. Let's look at these uh, last three reasons in, in some further detail. And I just took some sentences from these case studies that were done by a wonderful group of more than 20 researchers across the region. So, for example, in Peru, uh, um, Lorena Prieto and Camilo Cid state that in summary, the PEAS was created as a result of a national agreement to create a universal insurance scheme with a health benefits plan guaranteeing a minimum health coverage for all. So this is this equity motivation. Um, uh, let's look at um, Mexico. There were three key reasons behind the creation of CAUSES one of which the empowerment of the population, making it aware of its explicit rights. And I think that's very important to understand in the context of Latin America. Benefits packages are not, in the first place, a means of uh, uh, improving efficiency of health services. Um, I, what happened? I did something wrong. 
And uh, a second reason I'd like to stress is that benefits packages uh, are seen in several countries as a means to mobilize resources. And the best example that emerges from our case study, study is from Mexico. And in um, what a study by Felicia Noll and others, I think Eduardo also participated, state it, is that by designing this benefits package and by costing it, they were actually able to show how much money they needed to cover those that were formerly not uh, uh, insured. And by showing this, they were able to uh, diminish the equity gap between those insured and those not insured. So you have on the, on the graph, on the left-hand side, you have uh, the differences between um, the, in terms of per capita terms um, between those insured and those uninsured, depending mainly on public services. And on the right-hand side of the graph, you have the differences be between these groups after ben the benefits package was introduced and the resources were mobilized accordingly. And um, the, the, the study by Felicia and others says it nicely. Um, she says more like, like that thanks to the benefits package, it was possible to make the resource requirements evident. So benefits package are also means to show how many resources you need. I <laughs> and maybe at least to me, I think that's the, the most important common denominator that emerges from our studies. Um, I think we have to understand, at least for those that have been working in Latin America for many years, that we come from a history of uh, universal coverage. In theory, we promised everything to everyone. And the best example is the, the, the Haitian constitution, which basically says uh, the state is in the ob obligation to, to give whatever the population needs. And we all know that in practice, there was a lot of implicit rationing, low quality, limited equity, sort of first come first serve basis, and uh, a violation of the right to health on a massive scale. So benefits packages are a way of saying, of making explicit uh, what, what, the, what the right to health means. Third message. Um, Benefits packages are an extremely heterogeneous group. It's not, there's not just one size, one fits all benefits package. And uh, there are many dimensions around which there is a lot of heterogeneity, but I just put up three of them, target population of benefits packages you have from these universal benefits packages such as the one that operates right now in Uruguay, in Colombia, uh, to, to these much more limited benefits packages targeted to, to some vulnerable population groups such as is the case in, in um, Argentina, uh, in Peru, in Honduras, and even in Mexico, the benefits package is targeted mainly to those not insured to the traditional social security schemes. Large differences also in terms of the scope of services from a narrow set of maternal child health services, for example, in Uruguay, to these very comprehensive benefits packages in Colombia, Mexico, and Colombia. And then some countries focusing on a subgroup of key health problems. And actually, I think this is very interesting in the context of Latin America that there are these countries, especially Chile and Argentina, who decided not to put everything the people would need into a benefit package. They rather said, we want to focus on certain health problems and we will give VIP access to these services. We will have um, uh, payment systems that incentivize the provision of these services. We will have great information systems. We will provide guarantees of access, quality, and opportunity of care. But we won't deny anything to everyone. If people want to go get something that is not in the benefits package, they can still do it, but it's under the business as usual model. And I actually think that's a very interesting 
strategy in the context of Latin America where it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to really say no to a service. Um, also, in terms, this is just a, an indicator that shows you um, a proxy indicator of the differences in, in, in the size and scope of the benefits packages. In Argentina, we have a benefits package of a, that costs approximately $4 a year. And then on the other extreme, we have Uruguay with a benefits package of $650 per year. Um, message four. How many minutes do I have? still have? <laughs> Eight minutes, great. Um, benefit package, uh, it, packages in Latin America are much more than a list of prioritized services. We somehow sometimes look at them just as they were a list of services, but actually they can be sort of a cornerstone of a health system. And um, I tried to represent this with the, this is the cornerstone of Notre Dame, which what I wanted to come with, with this slide is that benefits package can somehow hold together the whole health system um, in many senses. Health benefits packages increase accountability. You tell people what they can access to and you can enforce it. They can be seen as an expression of the human right to health. They can be used, as is the case, for example, in Plan Nasser. I understand there was a recent event on Plan Nasser here. In Plan Nasser, they, the starting point for the um, performance-based payment scheme is actually a benefits package. That's There they have their priorities, and they start there to define what they are going to to, to, to pay according to the performance of, of the different involved entities. Um, and then more self-evident, but once you define what services you want to grant, you automatically um, can define what type of human resources you need, what type of infrastructure you need, how much money you will need. Um, and um, Finally, last but not least, and that's my favorite one, they really could become a strategic tool for purchasing. And um, the way I'd like to show is that when you look at these countries and you see that benefits packages are already channeling a huge amount of to total public resources, um, you can see that, for example, in Uruguay, more than 70% of total public health resources are used to finance the benefits package. In Colombia, it's a little bit higher, 74%, and all countries are increasing. Uh, th that's logical because they are all m moving towards uh, universal health coverage. But when you understand that they, they are using this increasing share of or public resources to finance the health services, you really understand the importance of benefits packages because it, it becomes a key strategic tool for purchasing. Challenges, there are many challenges and when I was going through my slides, I thought, uh, what a bad way to sell the idea of benefits packages, but um, I, I'd like to insist some on some of the areas that clearly need uh, support um, to make these uh, benefits pack to, pack, pack, packages really reap uh, the benefits they promise, at least in theory. Um, there are different types of challenges, methods, institutional, legal, and political, and then one I call from promise to practice, because just as I showed you with the Haitian constitution, the benefits package can be just another way of promising something you don't fulfill in practice. So this from promise to practice is very important. And um, I'm showing you this also because I think there has been way too much emphasis on the method side. And when you look at the, what's happening in the countries, method is an issue, but the institutional, legal, and implementing aspects are way more important than um, uh, the methods issues. So let's look quickly through some of the problems we have found in each of these areas. Methods, 
uh, the methods to decide what's in or what's out and to adjust the benefits packages are rarely explicit. They are rarely very robust. They are almost never applied systematically. Every time the government changes, a different button method come, comes up. And um, overall, we also find that the cost considerations are not incorporated systematically. Uh, there is a limited use of cost-effectiveness thresholds. Actually, I'd say there is a limited use of cost-effectiveness uh, when designing benefits packages. Uh, costing of benefit packages, we would say that's something so basic, but costing of benefits packages is often rudimentary and surprise sometimes even inexistent. For example, in Uruguay, they have never costed their benefits package. And we are talking about the benefits package that channels more than 70% of total public resources to finance the, the, the benefits package. Um, budgetary impact analysis is often inexistent or it's very ad hoc. Information available is often scarce and fragmented. Least them little systematic sources to cost health services, usually available when, when packages are designed and adjusted. Little updated information available on health priorities. Not all countries have updated burden of disease studies, for example. Let's not even talk about social preferences. I think that Chile is probably the only case that does this in a very serious, systematic, <laughs> you're laughing, you can tell us more, more about this, but compared to the other countries, I think um, you have made huge prog progress in this field. And, um, but, but when you look at Latin America overall, you will see that all countries are working very hard on, on strengthening their methods. And there are many countries now that, that actually already have um, um, HDA institutes or divisions in their ministries of health doing HDA informing coverage decisions. So we're getting better on this, but uh, uh, we are still in our infancy, I'd say. <laughs> um, process. Benefits packages are usually designed as short-term one-off exercises and there are no formal mechanisms to update analysis based on new data. And I think that several of, of us in the room have been hired to cost benefit packages and to design benefits packages without much nexus link to the local institutions and uh, without really helping to consolidate the institutional processes in place. Um, just to give you an example, that's actually from the Dominican Republic. That's the capitation they pay for the benefits package in the subsidized regime, which is the regime for those not belonging to the formal social security institutes. Um, and then the contributory regime. Um, and you can see how the capitation, which is meant to finance a benefit package that has not only uh, uh, become smaller over time, but it has increased over time. The, what they pay for it has steadily decreased in the in the in the subsidized regime. So when there is no coherence between the benefits package and what you pay for it, we might well get back to where we started, which is implicit rationing. Um, I will. I'm almost okay. Um, I will switch this. Maybe just one last <laughs> comment. Um, I, I was also, given the audience here, I was kind of thinking on where there might be more need for international support. And I think that there has been really too much emphasis on methods and consultancies and isolated HDA evaluations, and that we should think more about how to coach countries through this uh, exercise. And um, maybe one last comment related to, to this institutional 
institutional framework that sustains benefits package adjustment. We find a very fragmented approach to benefits package adjustment and coverage decisions in the, in the region. Many times there are multiplications, duplications between different entities doing the same thing. In Colombia, for example, the Ministry of Health did some evaluation of the benefits package and another part was done by the regulatory entity at that time. There was no articulation between it. In certain systems um, that are still very fragmented, such, such as the Mexican system, these whole processes are fragmented by sector. And um, I'd say that overall, while we are starting to think that evidence-based decision-making is something really crucial, and while we are starting to carry out um, a health technology evaluations and the reviews of, of the evidence, the link between what the evidence would recommend and the decision is still very frail at the best. And I think I'll, Anna, I lost, one last, I just like to invite you to read the book, um, just to give you a flavor of what's in there. Uh, we have these seven country chapters, and maybe what's what's interesting to read is that at the beginning of each chapter, we have an executive summary which highlights the key challenges and the key innovations and the table that synthesizes the key characteristics of benefits packages, which helps you to, to compare the, the, the different benefits packages. Uh, the book is less about methods and it's more about institutions and processes, which I think is something interesting in the context of what's already available. And you can download it both in English and in Spanish on the website that is published there. And if you got the little puzzle, if you put the puzzle together, you will al also find the link. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Ursula. So now we'll turn to Eduardo Gonzalez Pierre, who is Deputy Secretary at the Ministry of Health in Mexico. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a little squishy, isn't it? Sorry. need to get my presentation. Um, let me start by thanking IDB, Ferdinando Regalia, which is uh, one of the leaders in this project, and also Amanda from the Center of Global Development, and for the uh, kind invitation to be here to share with you some of the uh, perspectives from the Mexican side. Ursula did a great job in mentioning some of the Mexican examples. And I'll try to complement this with a, a presentation based on the chapter. I want to also credit the co-authors of the chapter, especially uh, Jota Panopolo, who also works in uh, the Ministry of Health in Mexico, and Ursula, which is just as knowledgeable about the uh, Mexican benefit packages as anybody else I know in this case. So let me start by uh, having a quick reflection of what the document does. I think up to date, all of us which have been in the field of policy making around uh, health benefit plans, up to now it's very complicated to put together the literature of what it was happening in different countries. You would have to go to different types of literature. It wasn't systematized. It was very difficult to track what was the latest, who were the responsible people, what uh, were the uh, issues addressed around the uh, different experiences we had uh, seen in the hemisphere. And I think what the book does, it compiles all these very relevant examples and really helps policymakers as all, and also a broader audience to understand what was meant, what was the purpose of putting a package together. Because as simple as it, as it uh, seems, it is very difficult to explain 
what is the package, how it's constructed, what it's supposed to deliver, and especially where it's supposed to go. So my congratulations to the authors and the editors in terms of this very, very key piece of documentation. Uh, I'll do my best to stick to the 15 minutes and just talk about four different things, give you a little bit of context, talk about the Seguro Popular and some of the uh, background arguments and experiences around the package, then uh, what's going on and what we see as the future challenges in terms of the next steps to follow. Basic data on the Mexican case, uh, we're a population of our reaching 120 million, uh, middle, high income, uh, GDP per capita around 13,000. I think we, our performance in terms of the health system is, I would say, average. We are on track on meeting some uh, global development goals. Some of them, especially maternal mortality, is not uh, on track. It has to do with uh, basic performance of primary care. And the big problem with uh, socioeconomic indicators, Mexico is a very uneven country, and that poses important challenges in terms of uh, what the health system is supposed to deliver, and obviously how you put together the package trying to address these equity issues and resource mobilization concerns that uh, Ursula was talking about. Now, you're, you're not supposed to understand this, but let me give you just three main messages around this. A, the Mexican system is very difficult to understand. It's a patchwork of maybe 70 years worth of uh, incremental reforms. It is still a dual system. Half of the system, is, half of the population is still covered by um, social insurance. The other half is Ministry of Health organized. Half of it is basically one big institution, IMSS, the Social Security Institute. The other half is uh, under the arrangement of Seguro Popular, 50 million one side, 50 million for the other. And what we have done in the past at least uh, 15 to 20 years is try to bring them together, try to make sure that they reach a similar stage in terms of uh, resource availability, both financial and human resources, trying to work, make them work uh, more evenly, eventually building the case and the basics to integrate them sometime. So if you want to understand the Mexican health system, you have to go through a progression of small, sometimes larger, like Seguro Popular in 2003 reforms, which are trying to bring together the system and trying to uh, turn it into a very uh, a more equitable and better functioning system. I would say that the system still underperforms in many issues, especially when it comes to uh, uh, equitable delivery of basic interventions. Now, going back to some of the issues which are um, presented in the paper, Seguro Popular, which is tied to these two types of packages that the Mexican case presents, is fairly new. It got started in 2003. It's uh, coming to its uh, 12th year of transition. And what it did is it affiliated 50 million people previously uninsured on an assistential basis through Ministry of Health coverage in a very short term uh, span of time. So now it covers 50 million, 55 million people, depending on uh, what records you look at. And the other half is uh, organized around two or three institutions. The biggest one is uh, the largest private sector social insurance EMS. And then you've got other social security institutions and lesser important uh, coverage. But let's say it's done a very good job in terms of uh, affiliating. I'll go back and I'll go into the other dimensions of uh, universal health care later. But uh, it has included a lot of people very fast. That, that has presented a lot of problems, and I'll, I'll go into them also very fast. It has two packages, not one. One package is the essential interventions, which are presented on the blue side, on the left, and does most of the primary care and basic hospitalization interventions. They're split into 285 um, uh, cases, and it's also attached to a list of 609 drugs. And on the right side, we have the uh, catastrophic 
package, the chi cost package, which includes 19 groups of diseases, and, pre and right now it has 59 interventions. And it's, uh, it's been very challenging to, to include these because it's a, it's a mix of uh, social pressures, I'll talk a little bit about it, uh, cost effectiveness issues, financial protection concerns, and also uh, some ethical issues around uh, what to cover and when. In terms of the uh, traditional universal health coverage cube, I would say that we have done a good job in terms of uh, the first dimension, which is basic affiliation to a formal scheme. Pretty much have all of the population under either um, social insurance of, or um, Seguro Popular. The uh, other, this, this, the second dimension, which is the, uh, the uh, services covered, is still the um, pending issue. Many interventions get covered, but maybe many do not. And uh, it has a lot to do with financial resources, but it also has to do with human and uh, physical resources around different parts of the country, which are very difficult to service. And on the financial protection uh, agenda, uh, we pretty much cover 50% of the total costs. 45% of uh, health expenditures are privately financed, and most of that is financed out of pocket. So Seguro Popular still has a pending issue in terms of financial protection. People get less impoverished or have less catastrophic care, but they're still spending a lot of their income on health care. What has happened with Seguro Popular is that there was a, a reshuffling of what type of interventions were paid out of pocket and privately. And over time, what we had is this progression of interventions. It started out as a... Um, a uh, very simple scheme that was uh, financed at the very beginning, early 90s, by a World Bank program, which was called um, Extended Coverage Plan. And then over the, over the uh, piloting phase, it grew a little bit more. And after 2003, when Seguro Popular was legislated, it started to grow progressively in a more orderly fashion, meaning that there was a uh, a more uh, democratized way of including interventions. They were costed, they were increased in the package, there was a supply side response to make sure that they were properly delivered. And today we have these two packages, the gray being the uh, high cost interventions and the green, I mean the uh, red being the uh, basic first and secondary level interventions. Now it has, it, it has been pretty much flat in the past few years, basically because the monies are also flat. It reached the progression, it reached the uh, target affiliation rates of uh, 50 million, and now there are no new fresh monies, and so the package has remained fairly constant, which is a big pressure for change. Some other basic figures, the catastrophic spending, well, basically, Cicluro Popular is paid both by state-level finances and by federal funds, federal funds contribute um, three out of four pesos which are covered, and then the other part is uh, state monies. And out of those total monies, about 89% um, go to the uh, basic cap package, and 8% go to the um, centralized catastrophic fund. This is important because the way the monies eventually deliver the package have two very di different mechanisms. The average spending on the package in 2012 prices is about $200. And what has happened over the past 10 years is that uh, the two subsystems have converged in terms of available financial resources per capita. They haven't converged in terms of uh, human resources per capita. They haven't converged in terms of um, activity levels per capita, some basic measures but they do have converged in terms of um, more or less how much money per capita each affiliate has, whether you belong to social insurance or you belong to um, uh, Seguro Popular. Some of the preliminary findings around Seguro Popular, which are very much directed to what Ursula was mentioning about Seguro Popular, is A, Seguro Popular through the package has promoted utilization. If you, there's some, um, 
assessments of what Seguro Popular effect is and that people that are covered by Seguro Popular have a higher utilization rate than non-covered population. This is measured in uh, prenatal care, access to child delivery, immunization rates, uh, screening rates. It also has delivered financial protection. I would say that um, impoverishing and catastrophic expenditures have decreased dramatically in the past 10 years. And it also has increased effective coverage in terms of some interventions based on access based on need. And you can measure quite uh, precisely that uh, it has services have reached the uh, targeted population in terms of uh, health needs. On the um, high cost service and the operational side, there's some issues remaining around the quality of the uh, accredited services. So monies have flowed much, much faster than the supply response in terms of which uh, facilities can actually deliver the right type of care. There is, I'll talk about this in the next graph, huge bottlenecks around human resources. It's a mismatch. Sometimes services get promised which don't match available specialists dedicated to care. So you, so you end up with substandard care in hard to reach populations in uh, basically suburban areas. And the match between medical care and preventive services, especially public health services, have not been quite as good as um, hoped. So we see a lot of late detection of some interventions. So the, the, the part which is the outreach, the community outreach part of care hasn't matched the access on medical services. So we're seeing, for example, cancer cases, both child and um, cervix and uh, breast cancer, which are reaching the system too late. You offer the interventions, mortality rates are too high, and many times it has to do with the difficulty of getting these patients to the facilities. Just a quick mention to human resources, which is an agenda we're pretty much heavily concerned now, is three messages. One, we were able to get the financial resources for Seguro Popular, but we were not successful on the supply response of human resources. So Mexico in general has low levels of uh, infrastructure and human resources, whether you you talk about nurses or you talk about general practitioners or specialists, that has been very difficult to change even over a 10-year period. Second, even if you look at total levels, the response has been quite slow, and it has been, it has been fairly larger at the Seguro Popular side, but at the expense of the other side. So total levels haven't increased as much. And what we're seeing is a reshuffling of doctors and nurses within the system, which works against overall outcomes of the health system. Now, some issues around uh, the strategy. The two packages were meant to work differently. The basic package was supposed to be delivered by the state authorities. The state level entities would deliver the basic package, while the uh, catastrophic fund expenditures would be centralized and would purchase directly to the states. So in terms of the purchaser provider split, it has had an even progress. The catastrophic expenditure interventions, these 59 interventions I talked about, have, wor have worked fairly nicely in terms of the strategic commissioning of the interventions directly either to private or mostly public providers. In terms of the larger package, which is the um, basic package, those are capitated packages to the states and the response of the states in terms of the purchasing provider split and how those monies become services at the state level, it's very uneven depending on the state. That's where the um, unevenness, that's where the uh, disparities in the supply response of the different states have played a role in perhaps increasing the uh, different performances we see across states. So, so, so Seguro Popular has increased, but it has also made some uneven progress, and we see states which are um, lagging behind in terms of progress, in terms of coverage, in terms of results. One final mention around um, the heterogeneity and quality. The, the Seguro Popular was basically a financial reform 
and the supply response in terms of accrediting quality services and what the organization of the uh, state level facilities would be has lagged behind. So in terms of uh, how we assure the quality of services, there's still a big uh, challenge to be made. And also in terms of the awareness of the package is also a, a large challenge. Let me, let me go into the final remarks, which have to do with uh, a lot of the uh, messages that uh, Ursula was presenting. What do we see as the ma main uh, challenges to come? We see the package as a necessary but not a sufficient condition. So we do see that the package has raised awareness. It has promoted empowerment across population groups. People do demand, but by no means do we say that um, access is ensured. So what is missing in the Mexican context is something that we have seen in the Colombian and in the uh, Chilean example, the uh, enforceability part of the package. And that is something we are putting together in terms of uh, future reforms, is trying to create an entity which can actually decide on whether a patient has or has not the right to uh, claim an access and whether that should be enforced through a central agency at the state or the federal level. Second is the um, efficiency effectiveness gap. We see a lot of new monies going into services, and we see that the gap between what actually gets delivered in terms of quality, if you measure it by effectiveness, whether it's mortality or um, disability, hasn't reached reasonable levels of efficacy. So for example, in terms of uh, uh, HIV AIDS coverage, we see a lot of coverage, but mortality rates haven't decreased as much as expected. When you look at leukemia coverage for kids, we do have the access, but the success rates for uh, survival are in the 50s, 60s range when we know that the uh, frontier of leukemia care should be close to the low 90s. So the big, big challenge is closing that effectiveness gap. It was also mentioned the priority setting framework. So we have a package. Some things are there, some things are not. What is not strictly institutionalized is how to provide an accountable, democratic way of putting more interventions in and what gets dropped off. So some things should be there. Some things, it's still debatable how they got in and why you have to keep them. So what's missing in the system is, a, is the right way to feed interventions and also to, as the conditions and the criteria change, to also drop them the way, when necessary. And the final one, which is also a point of reflection, is that the packages is not the only isolated uh, instrument, but in the case of Mexico, we also have a regulated set of, um, we call it inputs, which need to match the way the package is put together. So we have a separate uh, arrangement of how to include medicines, which most of the time matches what the benefit packages and protocols are supposed to deliver, but not always. We also have a certificate of need for equipment. We have a certificate of need for uh, facilities. We also have the accreditation of uh, specialists. And all these, let's say, separated strategies to provide inputs don't quite match in terms of putting together the necessary ingredients to deliver the right interventions which have been uh, included in the package for financing. So that's a pending agenda. It's not an easy agenda, but I'm sure that um, good lessons are to be uh, learned from other countries, especially the ones covered by the book. And final remarks, uh, three. Uh, number one, I think over the past 10 years, the package has been very useful in Mexico for the purposes of uh, including access and for making uh, the empowerment of patients in terms of uh, allowing for um, better care. Uh, it, had a, it has also raised the issue of uh, value for money and an explicit priority setting arrangement. Nowadays, it's very difficult to value interventions. It's very difficult to uh, 
examine cost effectiveness of them. And the package has made these things clear in terms of not that we have done all the progress necessary, but at least the issue is part of the uh, of the uh, reform agendas and the uh, discussions in uh, the financing of both subsystems. And finally, what the package has done is create a lot of pressure across the two subsystems. So we have half of the population with an explicit package with all its benefits and all its complications. And then we, are, we have the other half with um, a traditional implicit rationing system. Now, how long that can coexist, in which way an, an eventual unified system would move, whether it would move more towards implicit, um, explicit mixes, or whether it would move the implicit side to the explicit side, that remains to be uh, seen. But the only thing we have for sure is that um, the package needs to move into something more universal, more system-wide. And that's what uh, basically the next uh, months and years in the Mexican healthcare reform agenda are going to be about. So many thanks again. And I hope uh, you find it useful. And of course, uh, we're very happy to address any issues in the Mexican case, whether here or in uh, back home, and if uh, needs to be the case. Thanks again. Thanks very much, Eduardo. So this just has illustrated so well how the benefits plan really is the cornerstone for the entire health system and how it's actually forcing, in a way, reforms that have been on the agenda for many, many years. So next up, we have Dr. Sebastián Pavlovich, who's the superintendent of health, which is the regulatory agency in the Chilean health system. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Does any of you speak Spanish? Very well. Maybe I can tell you a joke then, if some of you speak Spanish. Very well. The first thing I wanted to do is to briefly describe the model. Maybe some of you already are familiar with it. But in any case, well, then we will look at statistics. After that, we will look how the compensation fund works. Then we will see what is the evaluation that citizens give to it. And then we will go to what you asked for, which is to describe it. But we will be brief in order to be able to be on time. The first thing I wanted to say is the Chilean system was designed as a system well, there were two parallel systems, the public majority system that cares about for 80% of the population and then the private health sector, which cares for 17% of the population. There's always obviously a group of people who are not under any of these two systems. Most of them are in the armed forces or in the health system of the armed forces. And it was seen as a model that not only that they not necessarily wanted to be a basic one, but simply as sort of one that would be an umbrella for both systems, the public and the private, that would guarantee the same care for beneficiaries of both systems, always bearing in mind that when the reform was being discussed in about 2005, all Chileans were afraid to sign into it, or rather to be get sick. Those who were in the public sector were afraid of getting sick and not being covered, and the ones in the private sector were afraid to get sick and then end up paying for everything. So we wanted to have guarantees that would offer assurances for all of these fears. I was hoping that this, no, no, would, this there's no light yeah, here. Okay, no, okay. well, it doesn't matter. Well, se, In any case, we defined four de, eh, de access, de health guarantees. De espera, there is opportunity, eh, that is waiting time, financial protection, access, and quality. Obviously, in general, the private sector 
the problems of access, opportunity, and quality were not a problem, but the financial protection was. And in the public sector, the problems had to do with access and waiting lists. In general, the problem of quality was present in both subsystems, although in the private sector, housing was a bit better. But a sector that would guarantee quality for all beneficiaries was something that had to still be implemented. And the idea of universal access, that is, that everyone, regardless of whether they were in the public or private sector, would have this type of guarantees, that is what is behind this plan with guarantees that would be explicit. Public, any guarantees that would be required by people regardless of their health condition. In other words, we went from declaring rights to guaranteeing rights through an administrative, well-known and, and explicit system that would offer these type of guarantees, as I said, op access, opportunity, quality, and financial protection. Uh, the prioritizing mechanism included a number of statistical studies, opinion surveys, and participation of society through a consultative council, which defined, well, the law defines certain key elements here, seeing which are the most frequent, the most serious, and the most expensive diseases or health problems and those that affect most people. And then the guaranteed interventions had to be effective, promote, prevent, heal and rehabilitate. And we also had to take into account how feasible its implementation was, or these guarantees implementation was, bearing in mind the infrastructure and human resource capacity as well as available resources. And uh, an implementation phase was designed. It began with 25 health problems in 2005 and grew to 40, 56, 69. And today we have 80 health problems that are guaranteed. So what we defined is that ISAPRES and FONASA, ISAPRES are the private institutions. There are seven ISAPRES, seven are open, eight, some belong to big companies, and there's FONASA, which is the National Health Foundation for 80% of the population. These are the ones, of course, that have to comply with these guarantees of access, timeliness, quality, and financial protection. This through health sector, and we have a number of private, we have some private health sectors, but several public ones too. But in the final analysis, what we need is to ensure quality. Statistics. As you can see, the assessment started with the 25 problems in 2005 until 2013, where we have added a number of health problems. And today, we estimate about there being about 18 or 20 million benefits associated to the guaranteed health plan. This includes both the private and the public sector. As you can see, in spite of the fact that the public sector includes or covers rather 80% of the population, it takes up most of the benefits because in, or in general because it is hardly, it's really not easy for private institutions to promote this mechanism amongst its user. Private sectors still allow people to ask for complementary service. This, of course, has increased the cost of health in the private sector. It's only today that private professional institutes are becoming aware of the need to encourage the use of this guaranteed package. However, we still don't see an, a true impact. New cases, well, you can see that here in the public sector, it's the blue line in the private sector. There's also been an increase in the red line, as I said. The use in the private sector is for access to medication, because in Chile, this is a public health problem. And as I said, the problem of access to medication, to drugs, is a problem. And the protection, the financial protection 
is for that area is used a lot in the private sector. As you can see, depending on the modality of health, whether it be as an out outpatient or hospitalized, we still see what the participation of the FONASA sector is within uh, this system, AUGE or HES, which are the most frequent health problems, diabetes, dysplasia, heart attacks, uh, health for pregnant women. We also have some cancer cases. Here's the use rate, the utilization rate, rather, per 100,000 cases. In the private sector, we see certain differences vis-a-vis -vis the public sector. But basically, we see what the case of diabetes is, acute respiratory infections, health for pregnant women. We don't have the cases of cancer here, but we have medication, also mental health. All of these are frequently used in the private sector. This slide gives you more information on this. And this system works by searching for solidarity compensation, which works among the different ISAPRES in the private sector. It looks for solidarity in a system that traditionally is one of individual health insurance, where these ISAPRES contribute a premium to a fund a per capita premium to a fund that then is distributed according to the risk portfolio of each ISAPRE. So there's some ISAPRES that contribute more because they have younger and healthier people where ISAPRES, some ISAPRES receive more funds from the small fund because they have older people or more catastrophic cases. In general, this fund works only on the basis of the 80 AUGE pathologies. So it is not large enough to create full solidarity in the system. And it works basically with the payment that people make. Each ISAPRE can set for, or fix a cost for the HES or for the AUGE for its members within certain margins, of course. And it, it offers in exchange the guaranteed health coverage. And as for the fund, this community premium is paid, and they receive it according to the risk-adjusted premium. Of course, the risk has to do with age and sex. This is calculate. This is how the compensations are calculated too. Well, there was a table here before; it got lost. Uh, just imagine it. I don't know what happened. Well, that will be part of the mystery of my presentation. But in any case, there has been an evolution, a greater compensation. What the table was showing is or has to do with the fact that there are certain age groups that contribute more than others when you make the calculation within the system. What is the opinion Chileans have on regarding the AUGE and just plan of explicit guarantees. In general, it is a positive opinion, especially in, in the public sector, because they assume that uh, care is free. There is a perception that it includes a large range of diseases and pathologies. They feel that they can have access to specialists and medications, that is, drugs, and since FONASA has the obligation of granting benefits regardless of the public network being able to comply or not. Very often, FONASA buys these services in the private sector. And this fee makes people that have access to clinics that otherwise they would not have access to, well, they feel satisfied, of course. The last opinion survey showed, well, people were asked, what they thought of AUGE, and even though in general the assessment is positive within the total population, if the person or his relatives have had direct experience in the system, this positive assessment improves. 
which of course indicates that there's a good assessment and opinion of the system, bearing in mind that in general our health systems, even in developed countries, are not well thought of unless you're very well taken care of. It's only after that that then the assessment or the opinion ends up being more positive. The general opinion has been more or less even, but it has been improving. Here you have it per tranches of the of Onassa's beneficiary population. 80% of citizens, as I said, are divided in these A, B, C, and D tranches. A includes people without declared income, B, people with minimum income, and tranches C and D are usually the middle class. And in the private sector, where there are usually no poor people, it's usually middle or upper middle, there also the assessment is positive. That is, the opinion is positive. What do they value the most? Here you can see if they're for NASA beneficiaries or private sector beneficiaries, catastrophic health coverage, access to medication, minimum cost, greater coverage, and obviously the differences between for NASA and ISAPRE. In the case of catastrophic coverage, it is more valued and there's a better opinion by private sector beneficiaries. And in other aspects, that what the negative opinion is affects the most has to do with the waiting list, of course, in the public, not private sector. So you can see the differences in the assessments. But in spite of that, in general, the same elements are there. Lack of specialists, the fact that certain deadlines are not complied with, that certain health centers cannot be chosen. This is especially so in the private sector because the AUHE system asks that this be preferred or closed provider systems. I only have two more minutes left. Very well. What are the main achievements? Well, in general, the people who have used AUHE, they have a better opinion than those who have not made use of it. They reduce uh, substantially waiting times. This is especially important for, for NASA beneficiaries. In general, it creates standardized packages that achieve economies of scale and that should, in the long run, lead to better negotiation power for insurance companies. The idea of financial protection through a fixed percentage of copayment is also something that is well seen by the population. And this in general has to do with financial protection, which is very well valued because in Chile there's quite a bit of out-of-pocket payment, and AUHE gives the better protection. Obviously, as I said, out-of-pocket expenses are reduced through this AUHE plan. Then there is a definition in order to act under clinical guidelines and protocols. These protocols having to do with care and financial aspects. So there has been an evolution there. And as for preparing the budget, well, obviously, it makes it easier to define what is the expected cost per beneficiary. In, as far as investments and technologies and human resources are concerned, supposedly this will allow us to better plan requirements to train specialists, in the future train human resources, and define care networks and their equipment. I'm speaking, of course, about the potential situation because some of these achievements have not been reached yet. There's still a pending definition that has to do with the state's capacity of defining the specialties, the medical specialties, the number of human resources, what the country requires, and where to strategically place these resources vis-a-vis -vis labor union pressures, interests, special interests, and of course, also political interests. This allows the superintendency, given this guaranteed package, well, it can do surveillance better. What are the main challenges? Quality guarantee that depends on the accreditation system is still being implemented. 
quality guarantee is basically defined under three cases, registry of providers, of individual providers. This registry is very sound, the most, this most best one in the hemisphere, or rather in the continent, and it offers excellent quality, and people know that specialists are taking care of them, but there's still a problem with accreditation of clinics and other establishments. To incorporate ISAPRE so that they encourage the use of the AUGE plan is still a problem. We need to improve protocols, for instance, by improving or incorporating available technology. But this not, doesn't only have to do with technology, but we also have to improve the definition in the protocol of income. There are a number of definitions that the AUGE plan has that are kind of questionable from the health point of view. I'd rather say this orally and not in writing, but for instance, we protect uh, hip replacement for people over 65 years of age. We're doing prosthesis of people for people who are 85 and 90 years of age, and these can last 10, 15, or 20 years, but we're not giving hip prosthesis for workers who are 50 years old and who today cannot work because of a lack of access to surgery. So this means that we have a problem of definition. Why did we define the age of 65 and not 50 or 45? Why did we define maybe an age limit? And that has to do with the response capacity of the healthcare system. There are not, really no other reasons to incorporate also delivery care. Today, we only have guaranteed analgesics during delivery. And there's a challenge not only of financially guaranteeing protection of deliveries, but also to see or guaranteeing postpartum, postpartum, that is post-labor care. Then we have the challenge of how to improve guarantees for beneficiaries, specifically by targeting certain beneficiary groups that are now excluded from the system to improve health care for diseases that are not part of the plan. This has to do also with legitimizing the plan itself. In other words, since, and this, by the way, has to do with pressure to expand the plan. We started with 25, now we're at 80, and then there was some kind of lottery where some people said there was, should be 120 health problems, but since it's a priority type system, we couldn't make everything a priority, otherwise nothing is a priority. But then we have the problem of legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis those who are not lucky enough, between quotes, to have these type of guarantees that could end up going to the courts. We've seen this in the private sector, but what we've seen in other countries of the continent shows that this risk exists if the system cannot truly give a good response to other health problems that are not necessarily guaranteed under the system. Also, there is a difference between what has been declared, in other words, guarantee or protection is given to the coverage of certain health problems under certain protocol, but there are some situations where some people have a certain health problem, but the defined protocol does not really cover their problem, and these people end up being excluded from the guarantees. So we have to see if what the plan is guaranteeing is a solution of the health problem, or rather only a given specific protocol that excludes any variations. That is something that also today is being analyzed. Well, basically, I didn't want to put this in writing, but in our countries, we say we're owners of silence and a prisoner of the word, which is why we don't want to say things in writing. But we have the problem of the waiting list. This is a critical problem. We've had a political discussion of this in Chile. There are mutual accusations between the present and past administrations. We're running the risk of, ha of something that happened, for instance, in Italy a few years ago, where they said here, in true, it's truly, truly true that parking is not allowed. We might get to that point where they say, are these guarantees truly, truly exist? Are we truly, truly guaranteeing these guarantees? So the risk of waiting lists has to do with the fact that we might not believe that the system is guaranteeing something. So there's a challenge and a problem with that. The other main challenge has to do with the access to medications and pur purchases have to be done of drugs. 
In Chile, we have a very unregulated market. And when you generate a guaranteed plan, you're generating a certain kind of inelastic demand, which does not allow the state to really negotiate well. And there's a definite regulatory challenge there and to strengthen the situation in order to break up the monopoly or negotiation practices of some pharmaceutical companies. I don't know if there are any pharmaceutical representatives here. Anyway, all of this implies that there's a need to improve the social leg legitimacy of that because there's always that risk there. Thank you so very much. Si se puede venir los panelistas. Could the panelists come up now? We have the co-editor Ricardo Beltran, Dr. Pablo Rich, Dr. González Pierre, and Dr. Gideon, Dr. Ursula. I had a number of questions, but I think it would be better to invite you, the participants who have been waiting here, to ask questions. Questions at this point? We'll take three. OK. First, you please introduce yourself and say where you're from. Doesn't sound like it. But. Yuna, no funciona. Doesn't work. <laughs> Speak loudly. Fernando Montenegro from the World Bank. Um, I, I, I congratulate the, the team and, and, and the leadership for this um, book. I think this is the beginning of a very interesting conversation. Um, I think it's a big change from the 90s to these years on what we are discussing, and that's very healthy. Um, I just had a couple of comments and, and observations. First of all, one has to make the difference between a benefit package and uh, a, a supplementary or a system of, uh, of uh, incentives to reach out the population and deliver specific interventions. Plan Nasser is not, is not a co was not costed and is not financing the delivery of benefits entirely because that's done through the normal channels of human resources, line budget items of the provincial insurance. So, we have to put a little bit of a nuance there because otherwise people who are not familiar might misunderstand that. Same thing in the Dominican Republic. In fact, in the Dominican Republic, it's a top up. It's 50% of what is estimated the cost, but in fact, it's a top up to what the Ministry of Health finances, which is the majority. Um, so th those are important aspects. Second, I think it's important to acknowledge that no country starts from scratch. So the idea that somebody is going to say, and from now on, we are only going to give this, is obviously politically not feasible. It might be feasible in some extremely resource-constrained uh, countries with a history of low or non-existent public systems. That certainly is not the case in most of Latin America. And, and therefore, when we speak about packages in, or benefit packages, we always have to consider what the situation is regarding what the institutions that are in place are providing already. So uh, I, in that regard, I wanted to hear from, from Chile and, and also uh, from, from Mexico. I think I, I know part of the answer, but I really would like to hear from, from the policymakers. When one person, you know, uh, before AUGE was introduced and before uh, uh, Seguro Popular was introduced, there were the ministries of health delivering healthcare systems, which when we look at the health outcomes, actually, you know, probably is due to those uh, sectors. But when an individual has some condition that's not covered in those areas, so what do they do? They don't, they have to pay privately, or they still have to go up and just wait and be unhappy? And uh, as okay. I said, I think it's very important. And finally, um, the issue of prices in Latin America, we have done a, a not sufficient research. And, and I think that this is a great conversation to start to think Cost of packages is not an easy thing to do when you are not looking at the private sector uh, or when you have a deregulated sector. It's easy when you have, when you know the cost and you know how much human resources is going to cost in a public sector. That is not the case in those countries that massively deregulated the public sector. 
And, and looking okay. at that, we have to make sure that we move Time's from up. inputs and to results. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. OK, let's collect two more questions. Um, let's do Rena and then. Thanks. I'm Rena Eichler from Broad Branch. So this is a question about what you're learning from from Latin America that might apply to Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and many countries in Africa are now also jumping on the UHC bandwagon and talking about defining benefits packages. But it's a, the systems are quite different. And many of them are more similar maybe to, the, to the, um, the Caribbean islands with uh, more of a British background. How, how do you go about sort of thinking about do they have really have a benefits package if it's a public delivery system? Can we think about that as a benefits package? Does it really have to be explicit? I, you, I know, Ursula, you made that, that, that point. But what, where, what are the boundaries of what we can call a benefits package, and, and when is it really something mushier or something that it mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work? Thanks. Excellent. And our last question here, and then I'll ask speci you specifically. My name is Mario Rieti. Mm -hmm. I am uh, executive director of Transparencia Honduras, mm -hmm. and also I was a former executive director of the Inter-America Development Bank for many years. My question is regarding the principal challenge that we are facing. One of the big challenges that is here is the corruption. Mm -hmm. The health system is suffering, especially in my country, for corruption. Unfortunately, what I want to know is there any, the first, the best way to find corruption is providing accountability, and transparency. But there is any translation of the word accountability, because accountability is more for me than transparency. But we don't have in Spanish a translation. We call probably, I don't know. This is my question is, what is the translation? No, it's no, it's no rendition de cuentas. I'm sorry, I, I'm an expert on this. I brought Jim Wolfenson to work on the transparency many years ago. Okay, what I'd like to know, Amanda, is is there any question, any word that you can use for accountability in Spanish? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm going to ask each of you to answer part of these questions, okay? so. Ricardo, let's start with Rina's question. First, what have you learned through editing this book that would be relevant to some of the African health systems? And related to this, how, are health benefits plans as relevant in an NHS type system versus a system that has some purchaser provider, well, NHS has a purchaser provider split, by the way, but let's say a system that has more private participation so why don't you answer that question? And I'll let you think for two seconds. <laughs> Ursula, can you answer Fernando's question? He said, we're not starting from zero. There is a health system already operating. What's this about the plan? And how do we know if it's delivering better than the thing that was there before? Sebastian. You work in a regulatory agency. So what do you think about the accountability and transparency aspect of AUGE? How, how is corruption addre addre addressed in this model? And is it better or worse with AUGE? And then, Eduardo, we asked you, um, let's ask you about what to do about the private sector. So you've mentioned yeah. it, a costing is only possible. <laughs> When we know what it is we're spending, let's say, so what do we do when we're trying to purchase from the private sector, which Chile does in the case of Auge, if the public sector can't meet the demand. Mexico also has a provision for that. How has that been going? And are you able to reimburse at rates that allows the private sector to deliver? And then how does that affect the ability of the public sector to build its capacity to deliver? So Ricardo, starting with you. All right, thanks, Amanda. Thanks, uh, Rina. That's a tough question. I've thought about it quite a bit because I've also done some work in Africa on the issue of priority setting. I think that uh, a number of African countries have a lot to learn from the experience of Latin American countries. 
uh, probably Ghana is the one that's come closest to the experience of Latin American countries by having an explicit benefits package, but it's currently underfunded. I think that the ability of a government to push forward uh, a policy of explicit priorities depends a lot on the maturity of the democratic and political system. Uh, I think that most of the African countries where I have worked do not yet have the political maturity and stability that a number of Latin American countries where I have worked have uh, reached, and therefore in African countries, it is very hard for politicians to declare that they will pay more attention to some services and less attention to others. That's often not acceptable politically. Whereas in Latin America, this idea was not acceptable 20 years ago and remains unacceptable for many in most countries, but it's actually been one that prevailed because it was seen by many, but by, by enough politicians as a good solution, and I think it's worked out. Uh, to the extent that African countries find politicians that are willing to support a policy of prioritization of government health spending, I think this is going to benefit them, and Ghana, in my view, is a clear example of it, even though they have lots of problems like anybody else. You're not going to answer the NHS is, is, a, is a benefits plan as relevant in an NHS type system? Uh, well, actually, maybe we should ask Sebastian. It, it, it is. I think yes. it, it absolutely is. The uh, feature of a health system to set priorities on some services and not on others is completely orthogonal to mm -hmm. the degree of integration that exists between who finances and who produces. And so uh, this policy applies to both equally. The ability to implement it varies, but I think that it applies to both and it's feasible in both. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Ursula. Um, I think that actually, I, I absolutely agree with you that we're not starting from scratch. We're not starting from zero to to something um, defined in a benefits package. But actually, I think that's the most interesting thing about benefits packages in Latin America, because we have had this experience of not defining anything, be it under the social security type systems or NHS type systems, with all the problems we all know, with all the inequity in the distribution of services, with the inefficient types of services. So I think that that benefits packages, packages actually arrived because this didn't work. So I um, um, fully agree, systems still, still exist, but in certain systems, almost everything is now cha channeled through the benefits package. And then second, um, Amanda asked whether benefits package, packages actually work better than what, what we had before, is that right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's very difficult to isolate the impact of benefits packages from other policy changes. I mean, for example, in the UNICO study done by the World Bank, um, if I understand correctly, you found that benefits packages are one common feature of countries that have moved towards, decidedly towards, uh, towards um, universal yes. health coverage. But isolating the specific effect of benefits packs, I think it's extremely difficult. What we can find, though, is that in, in countries such as Colombia, Mexico, Uruguay, the system changes that came along, one element of which was the benefits package, have made great progress. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Dr. Pavlovich, on the issue of transparency and accountability, and if you have a translation for the word accountability <laughs> that is better than rendición de cuentas. Quizá por alguna razón no existe en español esa palabra. <laughs> well, maybe that's why the word doesn't exist in Spanish. Now, what I believe is fundamental to combat corruption in health services is that there must be transparency in decision making 
as soon as civil society is included and different parties are around the table, it's possible to review conflict of interest. We're just beginning in Chile, but in small countries such as mine, it is difficult to think about politicians as if they just came down from the moon. They all have a past and they're going to have a future. So I cannot avoid conflicts of interest. Now, there is no such thing as an aseptic politician, but everything can be put on the table. And this goes to transparency. It goes to the future development of transparency as well as to ensuring that decision making is more participatory. AUGE is the main mechanism for establishing priorities and it is the most transparent. There are other providers of health care and we don't know what's given, why, who decided. And we also have other challenges when it comes to protocols because we have the designers of the protocols and then what we find is that these protocols were designed with a specific intervention or medication in mind and then we just say, hmm, this escaped us. And the third aspect has to do with the fact that public policy in health, none of this is written stone. It constantly needs to be revised and reviewed. So the last commentator I wanted to ask, what happens when you're excluded from the package, when you don't have one of the conditions that's been prioritized? What happens to those people? Is there a protocol that's applied? Do they receive the news from their provider? How is that handled? And is that a huge problem politically? OK. Uh, on the private issue, I, I think that um, the way to look at it is not quite the packages and the participation of the private sector, but the arrangements, especially the financial arrangements, which are supposed to accompany and surround the package, which are basically the capitated arrangements mm -hmm. and the, uh, let's say, the fee-for-service arrangements. So, so what packages do is they force government or public providers to define costs around what things mm -hmm are supposed to, uh, to be valued. And that, that allows for benchmarking across public and private. So, so I think packages, what they do is they, they, they deliver more transparency across mm -hmm. what exactly are things going to cost, especially if you're moving away from historical budgeting or entry-level budgeting. So, so, so they're supposed to, not automatically, but they're supposed to deliver more benchmarking across uh, the production of services, and that would allow for purchasers to understand the competitive advantages of commissioning things to the public or the private sector. So, so I think it's good. I, it doesn't necessarily mean that packages will provide more private-public uh, provision. It just means that they would be transparent in terms of what is best done in the private or the public sector. Mm -hmm. the, the, the other thing that I think it's interesting to consider is when packages get accompanied by uh, maximum waiting times, li like the case of AUGE, and, and then you have to deliver the intervention, and some of the um, alternatives to comply with the uh, regulator is to outsource. So, so that's another way that you get a good mix of private, public. Uh, of course, that, that doesn't go without uh, some biases mm -hmm. and some corruption around uh, manipulated waiting times. But in any case, I, I think it's good in terms of uh, allocating resources where it's best to yeah. deliver the value. And I think, you know, this is not something that's only in low and middle income countries because just this week in the United States, we've had a scandal around waiting times and distortion of the reported data from the Veterans Administration. So. <laughs> Healthcare is a big business, it's a growing business, and we're going to see this everywhere. The question is, how do you manage all those competing processes? Let me ask you another question. As over time, both of these packages that we've seen here highlighted, AUGE and uh, CAUCES, have grown in terms of their number of interventions. Uh, part of that is because the politicians have seen that the benefits plans work and seem to deliver some benefits for them politically, which is great. But on the other hand, 
Is there a danger that the number of interventions increases too much and then it doesn't fit with the available resources? Yes, How do you manage that pressure? Yeah, Eduardo. just yeah. on, the other, on the other issue you raised, mm -hmm. which was uh, what, what about the interventions which are not yeah. part of the explicit package? And of course, you can do, if you're a provider, a public provider, you can do anything beyond what the package is supposed to promise, but you won't get reimbursed for that. Yeah. So experimental research and other things, they do get delivered sometimes with a steep uh, user fees, mm -hmm. but doesn't mean that whatever is outside the package doesn't need to be provided. That's right, and in some cases there are charities that are out there that are yeah. you know, finding those patients. And things yeah, like that. and, and uh, with respect to the, um, the political consequences of the packages, I, I think it's uh, still fussy whether uh, you got the uh, Politicians behind the packages. The packages tend to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And uh, of course, <clears throat> everybody wants to throw in more interventions, but nobody wants to throw in the extra cost of delivering them. So you end up with these um, interesting formula where you would only pay for the marginal cost and not for the total cost. And of course, that that is very unfair when it comes to a newly uh, newly. Uh, open services with respect to services which have a long tradition of historical budgetings and mm -hmm. get money on the other side. So, so, so my feeling is that uh, you have to have very strong mechanisms on the budgeting, on the costing, and on the uh, arrangements of what goes in and what comes out. And if that is not, uh, let's say, sheltered from uh, politicians, then you eventually stop Stop. Uh, Sorry. You won't get a workable yeah. package plan. And I think it's happened in many places where you, mm -hmm. the package just becomes a promise, and uh, of course things go back to the back. implicit uh, right. arrangements of rationing. Mm -hmm. So all of this will depend on institutions being created that can be protected over time. You have to you have to build all the side arrangements around the package. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it won't stand. Excellent. Okay, Dr. Uh, Sebastian, and then we'll ask for a round of final remarks from a panelist. Well, there's an issue that is critical, and we see that in Chile. It's reached a crisis. Um, rare diseases, unknown diseases, and to include all of these in the AUGE plan is very difficult, or what it means is that we need to generate a public policy that provides a response. So this is very difficult when we talk about these neglected diseases. And then there's also social pressure and the political pressure. Now, perhaps there can be a policy that rations now, with President Lagos, Auge was launched, and it was also good that the current president said 80 pathologies. The other candidate said 100 pathologies. She won, and she was sufficiently prudent in order to not follow through on the entire part of the promise. And then the next candidate, who promised 120, who won, and now the president hasn't promised anything more. She just says, we must to assess. We must assess. And that was rational. Happily. Ricardo. Thank you. Um, I came up with three uh, challenges for benefit packages, which I think might be might find some room in an agenda for research or in an agenda for policy action. I think they're very important. The first one is that benefit package policies have not been very successful in promoting the consumption of preventive services that are cost effective. Uh, Eduardo was talking about that in the context of Mexico, which Chileans still have the same problem. I think that even in those cases where preventive services that are cost effective are included in benefit packages, they actually do not get consumed, partly because they do not get demanded. So there's a question that has to do with demand and not supply. 
Uh, and it's a, a tremendously important question. Benefit packages are spending much of their money solving the problems that were created because there was not enough demand to begin with for providing services that would prevent ovarian cancer, cancer of the cervix, uh, and so on and so forth. I think that there we haven't done a good job. The second big challenge is the insufficient number of medical specialists. Benefit packages have hit a ceiling uh, in their ability to expand coverage and to include more interventions because most developing countries do not have enough medical specialists in a number of key areas. You mentioned it in the context of Mexico. For us, it is a major problem as well. We cannot wait two decades until more medical specialists are produced. So what is going to be done technologically between now and then so that there's going to be improved access to medical procedures that are delivered by those medical specialists that do not exist today and that will not be there for a long time, especially in regions. And the third challenge is the abuse of benefit packages policies through the judiciary system, which challenges the concept of rationing on constitutional or other kinds of grounds. So a lot of progress has been made by a number of countries setting up and enforcing priorities. And then somebody, uh, individuals, interest groups, and lawyers who are looking for work find the opportunity to challenge uh, the legality of benefit packages, and they uh, demand insurers, both public and private, and often, typically, they win. I think that that is, that is draining the effectiveness of benefit package policies, and unless something is done, I know the World Bank has been working on this issue by training uh, uh, judges, but I think that it has not yet been effective enough to promote more rational behavior on the part of the uh, judicial system in countries. So those are the three issues that I think deserve more attention now. Thank you. OK, great. Ursula? Uh, maybe I'll start with the last one Ricardo mentioned. I'd say that uh, I, I would frame it in a little bit more general way. I'd say that Latin American governments need to think more about how to manage to say no. And I think the, the legal aspect is one aspect, but it, I think it's also a question of setting up explicit policies of what to do when someone doesn't need a service that is in the benefits package, that, but you can't just abandon that patient. So setting up alternatives, uh, institutional frameworks, um, and maybe something to add on this. I, I think there has been too much discussion on the opposition between health systems and the legal part. I think that actually it's a problem of uh, very solitary health ministers against a tripartite alliance between physicians that, that want to give the best in the name of the patient, the legal framework, and then some political positions that think it's not ethical to deny anything. So this one, I agree that this, this is one of the key challenges we have to work on. The second one is, I think both Eduardo and Sebastian have insisted very much and have shown it very nicely that you really need to link the benefits package to the rest of the health system. Make sure there are sufficient resources around in, in Peru, for example, um, the money they allocate to finance the PEAS, PEAS is about 25% of the estimated variable cost. It doesn't work. You have to link the benefits package to the financing, to the human resources, to the infrastructure, to the payment system, to the clinical practice guidelines. So this whole link linkage, linkage question is key. And then. Last but not least, um, I definitely think that we are still, we still have a very, very long way to go to establish um, more rules of the game related to benefit package and to apply them systematically over time, not just these 
usual um, parachuting of consultants doing some work on, on priority setting and costing. So institutional frameworks to make evidence-based coverage, coverage decisions mm -hmm. is, I think, key. Okay. Ricardo will be out of work then. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Take that back. Just that back. kidding, just kidding. Uh, Sebastián. Para cerrar. Sí, para cerrar. To conclude, I began to think about accountability and transparency. There are different levels in the health sector that can lend themselves to corruption beginning with how one defines public policy in Congress to what occurs in the ministries of health, and then at the level of hospitals and clinics, decision makers in terms of allocating resources on a daily basis. And all these three levels, there can be different strategies or different risk for corruption. There are a number of cultural issues. Now, if medical teams see that it is better to have a long waiting list and send patients to the private clinic across the street. This is a very high level of corruption risk. The plans need to be talking to the legal framework and public management of hospitals needs to be understood, procurement of medications also. So there's also stimulation to counteract or incentives to counteract corruption, but there's always this human barrier. Now, the right to health, that's another issue. Unless there's an epidemic among judges and lawyers against this, the right to health will remain. There may be strong arguments among economists and others, but the delivery of health services does not mean that that isn't a right, and that doesn't mean that it is without any limit. So we need this very open dialogue in order to better understand how we can progressively develop the right to health. And this is reasonable. And third, I heard news in Chile that the health effect was going to be evaluated. And I think we need to be more disciplined here. We need to see what the health evidence is. We have some information with heart attacks and strokes, but we also need to evaluate the health effect of our decisions. I think uh, when looking at packages, you cannot lose track of uh, the, final, the final objectives, which is you want a healthier population. And packages is not only, it's a very imperfect proxy of how to buy health. So, so, so it's always the case, as in anything else, you, you, you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to pay for consultations or you want to pay for cataracts or leukemia care or whatever, you're going to get that. And it's not so simple, not so clear that you're getting better health when you pay for that. Someone's going to be doing the leukemia care, whether it's trained or untrained. They're going to be using drugs. So, so it's always good to move. I, th I think Sebastian was making a very good point on that. You want to reach outcomes. You really want to package as close to outcomes as it can be. That's very difficult. And if you, can, if you have to settle with uh, intermediate goals, you want to make sure there's no gaming around that. Mm -hmm. so, so, so whenever the package, just uh, don't lose track of the final outcomes. What an excellent ending point, because not only that, you know, the Center for Global Development's favorite proposal is pay for results. So I, I didn't even have to. We're so attuned. OK. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you so much for coming. We're going to have a reception afterwards. You can meet and speak to the panelists further. And thank you to all of the panelists for an excellent presentation to the IDB for putting it all together. Thank you.